Hi, in this video we are going to talk about the uh, redox titration. Basically we try to look at some case study, try to work out some questions based on the DSC syllabus. Now, here it is page 32 of my notes, page 32 of the analytical chemistry notes. Now last time we kind of introduced this case study, which is the determination of iron content in iron tablet. All right, and first of all, you need to know that uh, there is no iron element in the iron tablet. They are all existing as iron two plus. Okay, they exist as iron two plus ion. Okay, so let's look at this question and let's do a quick recap. So we say that we try to find out the percentage by mass of iron, and to do that, we are trying to do a titration with acidified potassium permanganate solution. Okay, uh, we have an iron tablet which is uh, this mass and we first grind it into powder and completely dissolve in this amount of sulfuric acid. Okay, so after that the acid was made up to 250 so we do a 10 times dilution and 25 ml of the diluted solution was extracted and we perform a titration on it using standardized uh, potassium permanganate solution and the result is 28.1 cm cube. So last time I did these drawings illustrating how the experiment looks like using diagrams. So grind it into powder, dissolve in acid, uh, 10 times dilution and then carry out a titration with the diluted sample. And these are all the uh, data that we have Right, and, and of course, uh, we know the, uh, at the beginning, this is uh, 0.414 grams, okay? Now, the question says, now again, uh, my suggestion is, you first try out the question yourself using a paper or whatever, or at least you think about how to do it before you actually go through uh, my answers. Uh, in that way, you can get more practice opportunities. Now, uh, in part A here, calculate the number of moles of permanganate used in the titration. So basically, we make use of the uh, results. You know that number of moles equals to concentration times volume, right? So the concentration of permanganate is 6.86 times 10 to the power negative 4. The volume that we use is 28.1 cm cube. <coughs> make sure you change it into dm cube. Then you tap your calculator. And you tap your calculator. You get 1.93 times 10 to the power negative 5. Okay? So this is the number of mole of uh, permanganate used in this titration. Now, part B is, says that uh, we try to calculate the number of mole of iron in the iron tablet. Now, before we uh, calculate it, we actually need to know the equation, or at least the mole ratio between permanganate and Fe2+. Now, of course, the most simple way or most direct way is to write a balanced ionic equation. So you can put down, of course, MnO4- reacts with Fe2+. Um, actually, you got that equation above. You got that equation above. But in the real exam, if you do not have this equation, uh, how can you figure out the mole ratio between these two? Um, one way of doing this is you can pay attention to the change in oxidation number. Now, you know Mn is positive 7, and Mn in MnO4- minus is positive 7 oxidation number, and this one is positive 2, right? That means the reduction of one mole of permanganate ion in wealth the acceptance of five moles of electrons. So it has to accept five moles of electrons for one mole of MnO4- minus to be reduced. On the other hand, for Fe2 plus is plus two and plus three here. So for one mole of Fe2 plus to be oxidized into Fe3 plus, it will release one mole of electrons only. So by looking at the number of mole of electron transfer, you, have, you know that we need to have five times the amount of Fe2 plus in order to provide sufficient electron for MnO4 minus to be reduced. Okay? 
Therefore, we can easily tell that the mole ratio between the MnO4 minus and Fe2 plus will be 1 to 5. Okay? So you do not necessarily need to write down the equation. You can go straight ahead to say that the mole ratio okay, of MnO4 minus and Fe2 plus equals to uh, 1 to 5. Okay, so you know that the number of mole of Fe2 plus in a diluted solution, okay, um, using the results from part A, which is 1.93 times 10 to the power negative 5 times 5, okay, and which is equal to calculator. Okay, 9.65. Okay, 9.65 times 10 to the power negative 5 moles. Now, this one is in the diluted uh, solution, which is diluted 10 times from uh, the original solution. Therefore, the number of mole of Fe2 plus, okay, in the ion tablet should be 10 times larger than what we have in our titration. So multiplies by 10, you got 9.65 times 10 to the power negative 4. Okay? So th that would be the answer. Now, part C, calculate the percentage by mass. Now this one is not difficult. First of all, you need to know the mass of Fe2 plus, okay, which is equal to number of mole, uh, sorry, number of mole, of uh, iron multiplied by the relative atomic mass which is 55.8 that it is equal to okay 5.3847 times 10 to the power negative 3 grams then the percentage by mass of Fe would be this one, over the mass of the tablet, which is this one, multiplied by 100%, that you should have, okay, so 1.30%, okay? So this is what we get from the uh, calculation here, okay? Now, D, it says that the experimental result is lower than the value stated in the brand label, such as a, positive, a possible source of errors. Now, very, very common, common type of question, asking you to evaluate an experimental process towards the end. Um, so in this case, you need to pay attention to the chemicals that we actually use, rather than pointing out some very general source of error. Like you are not trying to say um, human errors occur at the um, determination of endpoint, something like that. That, that, that is too, um, too general. And we try to focus on the reactant that we actually used in this experiment. Now, we are involving the use of Fe2+. And you know Fe2 plus is very susceptible to oxidation. So there is a chance where the Fe2 plus there was actually oxidized it into Fe3 plus prior to the titration. In that case, it will result in lower amount of Fe2 plus available for the titration and therefore resulting in an underestimated result. Therefore, uh, we should put down here, okay, some Fe2 plus may Okay, react with oxygen in air and be oxidized it to Fe three plus. So you may you may put it this way. Okay. Now some of you may also uh, think about the MnO four minus because MnO four minus, like I said, is a very strong oxidizing agent, not very stable in aqueous solution, uh, susceptible to decomposition. So uh, can we say that the MnO4 minus uh, being decomposed? Now, 
even though it is being it is susceptible to decomposition, but if it decompose, then the concentration of MnO4 minus should be lowered. In that case, we will need a greater titer, a greater titer. So if you have a greater titer, uh, you should achieve an overestimated result rather than an underestimated result. And therefore, uh, in this case, uh, I don't think you can say MnO4 minus being uh, uh, decomposed or something like that. Okay, so this is what I I can think of. Now let's move on to the second uh, case study, which is the permanganate index. <clears throat> so this is an application of uh, using of redox titration using permanganate. Um, it is to find out the um, or to to show how clean a water sample is. Now here, this is an indicator of water quality, and we know that if a water is dirty, uh, this is usually caused by several different types of pollutants that may include uh, organic matter, which is basically a feces or organic waste or <coughs> any leftover from your, uh, uh, of your of your of your meal or dinner, right? Uh, ions that may probably be, for example, just now Fe2+, any ions that are able to be oxidized, it, they would be uh, you know, uh, types of water pollutants or contaminants. So, uh, of course, no matter it is organic matter or ions, they are oxidizable substance and they can be oxidized by permanganate. Okay, so you can tell if we have more organic substance or more ions, then it will react with more permanganate so that they are all being oxidized, right? So if we get a water sample and then we treat it with permanganate and we find out that a large amount of permanganate is used to react with this, um, with, with all these things, then the water quality is obviously low or very bad, very poor, right? So that is the idea about permanganate index. So, um, however, you see the permanganate index, they are usually given instead of permanganate, but it is usually given as the milligram of oxygen per liter. Now, this is the difficult part um, because instead of using the actual amount of permanganate uh, consumed it, uh, to reflect the uh, permanganate index, uh, the practical way of doing this is use the amount of oxygen uh, to oxidize it. So we are trying to imagine um, if it is not the permanganate that reacts with the organic waste, rather it is the oxygen that is used to react with all these organic waste, what would be the equivalent amount of oxygen required to oxidize it? Now this is the, the difficult part. Um, if you try to look at these two half equations, now this is the uh, ionic half uh, equation for the reduction of permanganate and for every one mole of permanganate uh, being uh, reduced it consumes five electrons now if it is oxygen that is doing the reduction it will consume four moles of electron per mole of oxygen so first of all you you, you can tell um, permanganate will require more electrons than oxygen right five versus four okay so let me give you an example. Let's just say if we have, um, let's just say we have, um, let's say one mole, one mole of permanganate, okay, being used up to oxidize all the water contaminants in a given water sample, right? Let's just say we have one mole of permanganate being used up, okay? So if we are not using permanganate and we use oxygen to oxidize those, uh, contaminants, then in fact we will need more, more oxygen to oxidize. How much more? How much more? Well, it's going to be 1 times 5 divided by 4. Okay? We make use of the ratio of the electrons. So in fact, if we are not using one mole of permanganate to oxidize those dirty things, we need to use 1.25 moles of oxygen to oxidize those things. Okay, so this would be a little bit difficult as we need to consider the mole ratio and do some kind of uh, conversion of uh, amount. 
in order to represent the permanganate index. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so here one mole that it will require uh, more oxygen to oxidize equivalent amount of uh, organic waste. Okay, and the actual procedure here involves a back titration. Okay, back titration, and um, using something called sodium oxalate. Now sodium oxalate is Na2C2O4. Um, oxalate is actually a dicarboxylic acid, which is having a structure like this. Okay, which is having a structure like this. Now, uh, this, instead of using it as an acid, um, actually, uh, this, the, the, the carboxyl group uh, can be oxidized to carbon dioxide by removing this hydrogen atom and break this bond, right? So, um, actually, this uh, can be oxidized, and therefore, it is serving as a reducing agent to, um, uh, to find out how much permanganate remains unreacted after back titration. So this is how it works. Now, anyway, let's look at this practice question and see how it exactly how it exactly work. Okay, again, uh, pause the video, go through this question. Better off uh, trying it out before I actually uh, uh, talk about it. Okay. Now, assume that you have already finished off this question, or at least have a look. Um, let's discuss. So here we are trying to determine the permanganate index. Uh, experiment was carried out. Uh, we have. 1,000 cm cube water sample warmed with excess amount of permanganate. Um, permanganate here in acidic solution, right? The reaction mixture is then titrated against uh, 0 0.0156 mole per dm cube sodium oxalate, and the mean titer is 32.1 cm cube. Okay, so the idea this time is not very um, complicated. So we have a water sample. Okay, should be very dirty, right? Should be very dirty, right? Okay, because with the organic waste here. Okay, so the water sample here, uh, all together 1,000 cm cube. Okay, and then to that we will add the um, permanganate, which is uh, five times ten to the power negative four mole. Okay, of KMnO4. Okay, and you know this has to be excess, right? Excess. Okay, and after that uh, we carry out a titration. Okay, with this sample. Okay, with this sample. Now, of course, this sample you can expect to see because we add excess amount of permanganate, so it should be uh, it should be purple, right? It should be purple. Okay, I don't have a purple ball pen, ball pen, so I use blue. But you should know that it should be a uh, uh, purple in color. And here we should have unreacted um, KMnO4. Okay, we should have unreacted KMnO4, and on top of the uh, 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 be red, we should have some uh, oxalate solution and you know that it is standardized so we know the concentration and the mean titer is 32.1 cm cube so this is the idea actually this is a very simplified uh, uh, example uh, because in reality of course we will do dilution okay um, because of some technical problem uh, part of my video was not being recorded but I have already finished off the question. So right now, um, we can just discuss with all the works done, okay? Uh, so part A here, what is the purpose of heating or warming the water sample with excess permanganate? Well, this is simply to ensure all the oxidizable contaminants are oxidized, okay? So not very difficult. Now, part B here, we try to put down a balanced ionic equation between permanganate and sodium oxalate. Now, sodium oxalate, first of all, you need to know uh, it will be oxidized to carbon dioxide, and of course, permanganate will be reduced to Mn2+. Now, to balance this equation, of course, you can go for the very traditional two ionic half equations and combine it. But here, I just want to show you how I did uh, in, a, in a fast way, in a fast way. Now, first of all, we make use of the oxidation number, the change in oxidation number for all these chemical species. Um, for permanganate, the MN uh, oxidation number decreases from positive 7 to positive 2, meaning that there are 5 electrons involved in uh, uh, 5 electron transfer for, for 1 mole of MnO4 minus. Now, for oxalate ions, when they undergo oxidation, uh, you know, for each carbon, it is positive 3 oxidation number, but there are 2 for each mole of uh, oxalate ion. 
So that's why, um, you see, if we have one more oxalate ion undergoes oxidation, there, there, there are actually two modes of electron transfer. Okay, so here, five modes of electron transfer. Here, two modes of electron transfer. So to find out the lowest common multiple, you can expect to see um, this one, this half equation multiplied by two, this half equation multiplied by five. And that's why we have two, two here, and then five, 10 here. Now, why is it 10? It's because there are two carbons per moles of uh, oxalate ion, okay? And after setting up these uh, stoichiometry, uh, the next question is, oh, where should we put the H plus and where should we put the H2O? Now, one way of telling us where to put H plus is that if you look at the left-hand side, they are all negative species, right? If you need to balance the charge on both sides, you must have a positive H plus on the left. So that's why H plus must be allocated on the left and water must be allocated to the right-hand side. Now, as to how much water is, <coughs> is required, we can look at the oxygen, number of oxygen atom on both sides. So on the right here, we have 10 times 2, 20 oxygen on the right. Here, we have 28 oxygen on the left. So 28 oxygen on the left, 20 oxygen on the right. That's why we need to add 8 water molecules on the right. And we may as well put down 16 H plus to balance off um, the hydrogen uh, content. So this is how I worked out the um, equation. Now for the calculation part, uh, again, we will do it backwards. We trace it back uh, to the beginning. So first of all, we use the uh, titration result. Um, the number of mole of oxalate ion used would be concentration times volume. We got this uh, number. And then we make use of the mole ratio between permanganate and oxalate ion, which is two to five, right? Two to five. So you know that the number of mole of permanganate ion unreacted, because unreacted here, unreacted, would be this number of mole uh, multiplied by two over five. You got uh, this number of mole of permanganate uh, not being reacted, not being reacted. Okay? So now that's why I put it down here. Now you realize that we add 5 times 10 to the power negative 4 uh, permanganate and there are 2 times 10 to the power negative 4 uh, unreacted. So you can easily tell that actually 3 times 10 to the power negative 4 moles of permanganate has been reacted. So that's why I put down here number of moles of permanganate reacted is 5 minus 2 times 10 to the power negative 4 which is equal to 3 times 10 to the power negative 4. Okay? Now, Right now, we know the number of mole of permanganate reacted, and we try to express it into permanganate index first by finding out the concentration of permanganate ions reacted. So you realize that it is actually 1,000 cm cube at the first place. So actually, it is already already per dm cube or per liter. Okay, so. Here, the permanganate index, we try to express it in terms of oxygen per liter, oxygen per liter. So that's why over here, um, I have to multiply this one by five over four. Now, why I say five over four is because, do you remember, if you look at these two half equations, you realize that uh, if you want to use oxygen to oxidize equivalent amounts of oxidizable contaminants, we need to use more, more O2. And how much more? Well, it has to be following this mole ratio, okay? So that's why over here, uh, if you want to use oxygen instead of permanganate to oxidize the, the dirty thing, so you multiply five over four, okay? And then, lastly, because we need to use uh, the mass of oxygen, that's why the number of mole has to multiply by the molar mass of oxygen. So it has to be 16 times two, which is equal to 0 0.012 gram per liter. Now, one last uh, thing you have to pay attention, they are using milligrams of oxygen per liter. That's why you need to convert it into 12 mg per liter. So that's the idea, that's the idea, okay? Okay, stepping into the next case study, uh, we try to look at how to find out the vitamin C content in a juice sample. So usually some juice, for example, orange juice, lemon juice, um, they contains a large amount of vitamin C. 
Now, in chemistry, vitamin C, uh, we will regard it as ascorbic acid, which is a very good antioxidant. Now, what do you mean by antioxidant? Uh, the idea is you try to protect the body cells or you try to protect some important body compounds from being oxidized. Okay? So how can you prevent them from being oxidized? Uh, of course, you oxidize yourself, you sacrifice, you undergo oxidation instead of the important body cells or compounds. Okay? So therefore, ascorbic acid being an antioxidant should be a very good reducing agent. Should be a very good reducing agent because a good reducing agent is very willing to undergo oxidation. Okay? So that's why over here, vitamin C, they are reducing agents. Okay? So this is the ionic half equation for is uh, oxidation. So basically, uh, two electrons are being uh, released per mole of ascorbic acid. Now, if you want to find out the amount of uh, vitamin C, which is a reducing agent, of course, we can use an oxidizing agent and we perform a titration. So in this case, we can use iodine to determine. Okay, so you see iodine reacts with uh, the citric acid or the ascorbic acid uh, to form the product as well as the uh, iodine ion. And this one should occur an, in an acidic medium, in an acidic medium, okay? So that's the idea. Now this, this kind of show you how the structure changes. Now you see the OH uh, has become the uh, ketone, okay? So this one is an oxidation. Think about it as the uh, alcohol oxidized to ketone. Uh, with the removal of two hydrogen atoms, it has to be a, a oxidation, okay? Now down here, we have a practice question. Uh, again, uh, try to go through it yourself first before looking into my explanation. Okay, so right now, uh, we have vitamin C here. Uh, it reacts with iodine according to the reaction above, okay, like this. Now, lemon is a citrus fruit. Uh, citrus fruit means a uh, fruit with seed. Okay, and we are talking about, now because citrus by itself, it means seed. But um, of course you have many other fruits that is not citrus fruit, but at the same time it has seed. But uh, later on it turns out that citrus fruit are um, uh, those with a lot of citrus acid, which is another acid uh, presence in those citrus fruits. But, but anyway, um, Lemon is a citrus fruit, and whenever you see citrus fruit, that means they have a lot of vitamin C, as well as a lot of uh, citrus acid. Now, anyway, um, going back to here, lemon is a citrus fruit containing a lot of vitamin C. Uh, 100 sample of lemon juice was first diluted to 250, and then the diluted sample was transferred into a conical flask containing excess potassium iodide. Okay? Now, sulfuric acid and a few drops of starch solution is also there, okay? <coughs> the dilute acid in the conical flask was then titrated against 0.18 mole per dm cube of potassium iodate solution. Uh, the average titer is uh, 16.8 cm cube to reach the end point. Okay, so <coughs> let's again express the story in the form of diagrams. So first of all, we have the lemon juice, right? Um, the lemon juice here, okay? So 100 cm cube, okay? First, we carry out a dilution, okay? So, which is 250 cm cube, and then we take uh, a small portion for the titration, okay? But here, we have a couple of different things. We have obviously uh, the vitamin C, okay? Diluted, okay? We also have excess Ki, okay, and then H plus, and then starch, okay. All right. Now think about it. Uh, also, also above we have the uh, KiO three, and you know that it is zero point eight one eight m, and then the average titer is sixteen point eight cm cube, okay. So that is the idea about the experiment. Um, but you may ask, hey, sir, aren't we using iodine as our titration, but why are we loading up uh, potassium iodate 5, uh, and what is, the, what is the reason of adding excess Ki down there? Um, 
Actually, if you refer to previous pages, uh, when we talk about Aldin, okay, we say that Aldin in aqueous solution is unstable, so we try to prepare the Aldin in situ, in situ. And by preparing in situ, that means um, actually we add the iodate into the conical flush containing iodide, and there will be a rapid reaction generating iodine inside the conical flask, inside the place where the reaction actually takes place. Okay, so the iodine generated will subsequently react with this uh, vitamin C, uh, and then uh, producing the iodine. Okay. So that's why uh, the setting is a little bit different than what you expected. Okay, now A, it says that potassium iodide, iodide reacts with, to form iodine and acidic condition. Write down the balanced ionic equation. So this one, IO3 minus reacts with I minus H plus to form iodine and water. Okay, um, of course, if you know, um, if you have memorized the equation, you should be able to tell it's 5, 6, 3, and then um, 3. Okay? should be like this. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, again, you can separate it, separate it into two ionic half equations and combine it, or you can look into the change in oxidation number. Change in oxidation number. Okay? I don't want to spend too much time on uh, teaching how to balance ionic equations here. Now, how to determine the end point of the titration? Now, of course, it has to be the color change, right? And we have the starch here. But don't, uh, so pay attention that uh, the starch and iodide does not give you a blue-black color. It must be the starch and iodine, right? So down here at the beginning, uh, or during the reaction, it should be colorless. Right until the vitamin C are gone, and that extra drop of iodate uh, down here to the conical flask, reacting with the iodide, generating iodine, and that extra drop of iodine are then able to combine with the starch, giving you the blue-black uh, color, which indicates the end point. Therefore, uh, to determine the end point, uh, the solution changes from colorless to blue-black. Right, you tell me about the color change at the end point. Okay? Now, C, calculate the concentration of vitamin C. Okay? Uh, in this case, it is actually a direct titration. It is an actually a direct titration uh, between iodine and the vitamin C. Okay? Now, first of all, based on the titration results, then we can easily tell number of moles IO3 minus that is actually reacted will be 0 0.180 multiply by the volume which is equal to okay okay now here we need to pay attention because uh, we should not use this number of mole uh, as the iodine because it is not right so you need to pay attention to the mole ratio now, first of all, you need to know that the mole ratio of IO3 minus and iodine, okay, would be 1 to 3, 1 to 3, okay, 1 to 3, based on the equation here. So, uh, the number of moles of iodine generated should be the number of moles of iodine multiplied by 3, okay? But we also want to look into the mole ratio between iodine and vitamin C. Okay? Now, this equation is given here, so you realize that it is one to one mole ratio, right? So we can also fit in uh, this mole ratio into this here, into this ratio. So we, I also put down vitamin C here, okay? Which is equal to one to three to three. Do you agree? One to three to three, okay? Therefore, the number of mole of Vitamin C, okay, diluted, okay, remember it is being diluted, equals to times 3, equals to 
9 times 10 to the power negative 3 moles, okay? And then, basically, we do, um, we, we, we tackle the dilution here, uh, 100 diluted to 250, so it's uh, 2 times, 2.5 times dilution, so we can put down um, the number of mole of C6H8O6 undiluted, or the original, would be times 2.5, right? 2.5. So, answer times 2.5, okay? And then, the concentration of C6H8O6 will be equal to 0 0.02268, okay? Divided by 100, okay? Equals to 0 0.22 seven mole per dm cube okay so this is how it works should not be too difficult for this one all right now uh, okay the, so the last case study case study four we try to determine the amount the concentration of sodium hypochlorite in chlorine bleach um, first of all you need to know sodium hypochlorite or mainly the hypochlorite ion is the active ingredient in chlorine bleach or household bleach. So hypochlorite ion is a strong oxidizing agent. Uh, it can be used to, uh, of course, disinfection or killing bacteria, germs, and it can also be used to bleach our clothes because it also has a bleaching power. And actually, the bleaching ability is coming from the fact that it is a very good oxidizing agent. <clears throat> so, because it is an oxidizing agent, it can be reduced to chloride ion uh, by the iodine ion. Because you know that for the iodine ion, uh, it is a strong, okay, uh, reducing agent. It's a very common, very strong reducing agent. Uh, iodine has a tendency to oxidize back to iodine, uh, knowing that iodine is not very reactive. Okay, and again, it's in acidic uh, condition. So here, this is the equation. OCl minus reacts with iodide in acidic medium to form iodide, sorry, chloride, iodine, and water. Okay. Now, uh, if we add excess amount of iodide into the hypochlorite ion, then we can generate uh, the iodine here. Okay. So later on, we can titrate against uh, the iodine to find out how much uh, iodine is formed. So right here, we are not doing a back titration. Okay, we are trying to uh, establish a quantitative relationship or establish a mole ratio between OCl minus and iodine. Or in other words, we are trying to, uh, now this is not precisely correct, but we are trying to convert uh, the OCl minus into iodine, okay, so that later on when we titrate against the iodine and find out how much iodine is formed, we are able to trace, trace it back and find out how much OCl minus that we have, okay? And so this is the idea. So bear in mind, this is not a back titration. We're just trying to convert the OCl minus into iodine and then carry out a very standard direct titration, okay? Uh, but how can we titrate against iodine? Uh, the reagent that we use is a standard sodium thiosulfate solution. And again, using starch as an indicator. Okay? Now, let's look at this practice question. Well, we have um, household bleach containing sodium chlorate 1. Now, this is uh, the naming method of hypochlorite ion using the stock system. Uh, chlorate 1, uh, because you know that the O here is plus 1 oxidation number, right? Uh, so, therefore, chlorate 1. Um, this is the active ingredient in an experiment to determine the, the content of NaOCl, uh, 25 ml of the bleach diluted to 250. Okay, Two, 25 cm cube diluted bleach treated with excess potassium iodide under acidic solution. Um, the iodine produced was then rapidly titrated against a standard uh, sodium thiosulfate solution. This is the mean titer. Okay. 
So now we have the household glitch here. Okay, 25 cm cube uh, NaOCl, right? And first of all, it is being diluted to, okay, 250, okay, right? And then we will take out a small portion, okay, which is 25, but here we have added in uh, excess uh, Ki, right? Excess Ki, okay? So therefore, here we should have aldine, right? And then some Ki, and then of course H plus, and then starch, okay? And then we are doing a, a titration using S2032 minus, we know that it is 0 0.0550 M, and the mean titer is 20.9 cm cube. Okay, so basically this is uh, the idea about uh, the experiment. Again, pause the video and try it yourself first before looking into my explanation. Okay, now uh, first of all, before I, I talk about it, I want to ask what is the color of the analyte before the titration? Now in this case, because we have the iodine, right? And then we have the starch. Actually, do we have the starch? Uh, we don't have it, right? Um, so let's cross it out. We don't have the starch here at the beginning, okay? So it should be color, uh, it should be a little brown, okay, brown color at the beginning, or maybe yellow, it depends on the concentration. Oh, I don't have a yellow highlighter. Anyway, uh, at the beginning, it should be a little bit yellow, right? And as the titration proceeds, you should expect to see the solution becomes uh, paler and paler and eventually colorless, right? But later on, we will add the uh, indicator to indicate whether or not the aldine is still there, okay? Because again, uh, looking at the very pale yellow color, uh, whether or not it becomes totally colorless is uh, you know, impractical to be determined by our naked eyes. Therefore, we need an indicator, but probably we'll talk about it later, okay? Now, let's go back to this uh, calculation, uh, concentration of sodium chlorate. So, again, we're trying to look at the number of mole of S2O32 minus, which is equal to um, 0 0.0550 multiplied by the titer, which is 0.055 times 20.9 divided by 1,000, okay? We have... this uh, number of mole, and then because of the mole ratio of thiosulfate to uh, the iodine being 2 to 1, right? So the number of mole of iodine, okay, diluted would be uh, this one. Uh, divided by 2, divided by 2 this time, okay? So answer, divided by 2, we got 5.7475 times 10 to the power negative 4, right? Okay, now, you notice the mole ratio between the iodine and OCL minus is also 1 to 1, right? So you can also put down uh, well, actually, we can do it here, but I, I forgot, but you know, it doesn't really matter. I'll just write a little bit more, okay, of aldine to OCL minus equals to 1 to 1. Therefore, the number of mole of OCL minus diluted uh, equals to the same uh, value here, okay? And then, we just have to perform a tight, uh, dilution. We tackle the dilution problem. Uh, therefore, number of OCL minus undiluted would be 5.7475 multiplied by 10. We got this one, okay? And later on, uh, we have the concentration of OCL minus being uh, Twenty-five divided by one thousand, we have zero point 
zero point three, right? No, 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 zero point two, uh, three zero mole per dm cube. Okay, so that would be the the answer. Okay, that would be the answer. Okay. Now let's look at part B, uh, more about the experiment itself. So once the potassium iodide is added to the bleach, the titration should be, should be carried out as soon as possible. Explain briefly the rationale behind. Um, because you can tell, um, as we add the uh, Ki to the to the bleach, then it generates iodine. But like I said, iodine is very unstable in water. Therefore, we have to carry out the titration as soon as possible. Okay, because. Okay, iodine, iodine is form is unstable, okay, and may decompose, okay. So this is the reason why. And C here, instead of adding the starch solution at the beginning, it is added until it is close to the equivalent point. Explain why it is added so. So this one, we kind of talked about it before. Um, because at the beginning, you see, at the beginning, we have quite a high concentration of aldine. Now, if you add the starch, then the aldine will be uh, combined with the starch very strongly. So to the point where uh, the aldine is very unlikely to be released it out from the starch. So there's a chance where even though we have added sufficient amount of thiol sulfate, um, there are still some aldine bounded onto the starch. So the blue-black color never fade away. However, uh, towards the end point where the solution becomes very, very pale yellow, um, the concentration of aldine is very low. It is less likely for the aldine to be tightly bound onto the starch. So the aldine will be more easily liberated from the complex. So that's why um, we add the starch towards the end. Okay. So um, this one, if you want to explain it, so you may say that uh, because okay, uh, aldine at high concentration may be tightly bounded onto the starch molecule okay and will not be liberated even when uh, the equivalent point is reached okay As a result, the solution may not be decolorized at the equivalent point. Now I kind of uh, uh, write a little bit more, uh, but I think you get the idea. Uh, I think the key here is the last sentence, but I try to be more substantial. Uh, the key is uh, the solution may not be decolorized or the solution may not be changing from blue black to colorless uh, even the equivalence point is reached so therefore the end point observed uh, may not be consistent with the equivalence point okay so that's the idea about uh, this question so now so far we have um, go through four case studies but of course, um, you can go through more questions at the, at the, at the, at the end. And like I said, uh, redox titration is very important in analytical chemistry. Every year we should have at least one. It could either be a back titration or redox titration, or maybe a combination of both. So make sure you study hard and uh, you get used to this type of long question. Usually the experiment is quite complicated, but don't worry. Um, just like what I did, uh, highlight all the important information, try to use diagram to help yourself to get familiar with the situation and then perform the calculation uh, uh, step by step, make sure you double check, okay? So that's it for today. 
I'll see you guys later. Bye bye.